continuing with astronomy where we left off last class period. So last class period, I had started by talking about what's in our solar system and listing the planets in order. Uh, one of the things that I would like you to know about astronomy is to know the eight planets in order from the closest one to the sun out to the farthest one from the sun and also to be able to differentiate this this differences like the four inner ones are rocks the four outer ones have big gas atmospheres although they have rocks at the center and then like which ones have moons and and things like that so you have some knowledge about these planets so i ended last class period by indicating <laughs> that the density of the rocky planets, the inner planets, are all greater than three grams per centimeter cubed. So we have densities that are similar to rocks. When we get to the outer ones, they're all going to be under two densities that are more like gases. Well, actually, more like liquid, really, because um, like ice or, or water. Here's something that's interesting to note. The orbital speeds of the planets around the sun decrease with the distance from the sun. So if you get farther away, the speed at which the planets are traveling is getting smaller and smaller. At first, this seems to be an oddity, but with physics, we can actually calculate how fast something has to be traveling to go in a circle and we see, yep, that's what physics demands, that the farther out there you get, the slower it's going to travel. Okay, looking at each inner planet individually, Mercury, the closest planet to the sun. Because it's so close to the sun, it's getting baked. There's a lot of thermal energy from the sun so that during the daytime, that is the part of it that's facing the sun at any moment, can be as hot as 430 degrees Celsius. How hot is 430 degrees Celsius? Well, that's a lot hotter than boiling water, right? Boiling water is 100 degrees Celsius. At the same time, it's colder than many of the really hot things we have, but you couldn't live there. If you were subjected to 430 degrees Celsius, you would obviously not survive the nighttime cold, the side that's in shadow, drops to minus 170 degrees Celsius. Is that better? No. What's wrong with minus 170 degrees Celsius? You what? It's too cold. We would be frozen solid. So life couldn't exist, or at least not our kind of life, in either of those two temperature ranges. So mercury, not very hospitable to life. Why does it have such a big temperature change? I mean, on earth, it's hotter during the daytime and cooler during the nighttime, but not nearly that big a temperature change. Why would it have such a big temperature change? Any ideas? And if you don't, that's fine. But if you have ideas, I'd like to hear them. Is it because it doesn't have atmosphere? That's exactly it. Because it has no atmosphere, it doesn't have something to distribute thermal energy. It doesn't have convection. Remember, we talked about the ways of transporting energy. It doesn't have convection. The convection due to the air on our planet helps to keep temperatures kind of uniform around the globe. Well, not around the globe per se, but from day to night because the air doesn't move that far and it transports it so you don't have huge changes in temperature in small re, um, distances. So without that air, the temperature can change dramatically. So when the sun goes down, the rock cools very quickly and it gets very, very cold. So almost no atmosphere. This almost, we usually don't even put it there. We don't even justify it. We just say no atmosphere. There is so little atmosphere. Any, okay, any atmosphere it has is hydrogen that was blown off of the sun and hit Mercury. 
and that hydrogen might at the longest stick around for a couple weeks before it's lost. So it has no permanent ad, um, atmosphere, but it could collect a few hydrogen atoms that might stick around for a week or two before they're gone. So virtually nothing. And it's only slightly larger than our moon. It's small. Now, if you look at the surface, the surface of Mercury looks a lot like our moon. Not exactly the same, but a lot. You have rock, and then you have craters. Why would you have craters on the moon, on Mercury? What, would, what, what causes the craters? Stuff hitting it. So obviously things have hit Mercury in the past. The things have hit the moon in the past. Have things hit the Earth in the past? Yes, and they still do. Once a month, we have a fairly, on average, we have a fairly large object that comes into the Earth's atmosphere. Usually they burn up and don't get to the ground, but every now and then they get to the ground. And we talked about when we were in geology and geologic time, that Chicxulub crater in the Yucatan Peninsula. That is a huge impact crater. And there is a, not nearly as big, it's only about a mile across, impact crater in, in Arizona, just outside of um, Flagstaff, the Beringer Meteor Crater. We have signs that the Earth has also been hit by objects. Now, if you happen to be in the place where the object hits and it creates a crater a, crater a mile apart, that's going to be pretty damaging to your life. But it doesn't happen much to us. The moon gets hit by stuff a lot more than we do. And that's because our atmosphere makes things burn up. The moon has no atmosphere. If things don't burn up, they just hit the surface. The same would be true. Mercury has no atmosphere, so things are just going to hit the surface. But think about this aspect. Things hitting Mercury or the Earth or the moon. Every time there's a collision, that means there's one less thing to hit. And so until man started putting debris out there in space, Every time there was an impact between a planet or moon and some debris, that meant there's one less piece of debris. So the frequency of getting hit by debris is going to slow down over time. So as we think about using a scientific time frame, the development of the solar system, in the early days of the solar system, there would have been lots and lots of debris and lots and lots of collisions. But as the collisions occurred, there's less and less debris. And when I say debris, I'm basically meaning asteroids here. Less and less asteroids, and thus less and less asteroid impacts, less and less of these craters being created. But we see signs of them. Now, there are things on Mercury that are not like the moon. Um, looking at this, these lines here are not like anything I see on the moon. But you know what? I don't know about those. I actually don't know what those are. I just didn't notice them until now. A feature that you have on Mercury that you don't have on the moon is what we call lobate scarps. There are places where you have a cliff, and of course this picture is not detailed enough to see it, but you have a cliff that is very long and has a curvature to it. And those lobate scarps are believed to be places where you've had the ground sink to make the cliff. You know, I grew up in Monterey Bay Academy. We have a big cliff and then the beach. Well, that cliff was created by erosion. The water comes in, erodes the bank to make the cliff. Those cliffs couldn't have been made by erosion because you don't have the agents to move material away. You don't have wind or water to move material away on Mercury because it has no atmosphere, no liquids. So the belief is that Mercury has cooled, and as it cooled, it shrunk because you know you saw the demonstration a long time ago when I heated the metal, it expanded. Well, the same thing works with rock. So when it cools, it shrinks. And as it shrinks, the outer hard crust cracks and things fall in. Another thing that's not here is magnetic field. The Earth has a magnetic field. We've talked about it. So now we look at, at Mercury. Does it have a magnetic field? The answer is it has a very, very weak magnetic field. So if it has a magnetic field, what creates the Earth's magnetic field? It's what? 
I, I know I misheard her. I thought I heard aluminum. I'm pretty sure that's not what she said. What did you say, Ivy? I think, I, I think I'm wrong. She thinks she's wrong. Well, it's swirling molten metal. Now, so does that mean we have swirling molten metal in mercury? No one could believe that mercury should still have anything molten in it, but it, it might have still a little bit of metal swirling, or it could be just that you have kind of like a frozen magnetic field, like you have a, a magnet just that's a permanent magnet because it's frozen. Next out is Venus. 95%, okay, let's go to 95% the diameter of the Earth. That's a big planet. Well, big for a rocky planet. The Earth is the biggest of the rocky planets. We're special that way. It's a lot like the Earth. It's the next closest to the sun from Mercury. The next one out is going to be the Earth. But it has a very dense atmosphere. Its atmosphere is about 90 times thicker than ours. Air pressure there is much higher than the air pressure here. So it would be kind of crushing on us. It would be like swimming about, well, let's say 30 feet under the ocean or under the surface of the water all the time for the pressure. Can we withstand that? Yes, we can. But it would be a lot different. But then there's the temperature problem. Venus has a very thick atmosphere. So with the very thick atmosphere, we talked about Mercury not having a thick atmosphere, or not having an atmosphere, allows temperatures to swing a lot. Mercury with a very thick atmosphere has essentially the same temperature everywhere on the entire Mercury, Venus. Venus has essentially the same temperature everywhere on the planet. And that temperature is somewhere around, I think it's 800 Fahrenheit. I don't remember if it's Fahrenheit or Celsius. But it's a really hot temperature. So what would happen to us if we were on Venus? Yeah, we, we would burn. It would be like, you know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. We'd burn. It wouldn't be very good for us. There's another thing. Its atmosphere is pretty, I believe it's acidic. It's a... It's a very harsh atmosphere. Now, the Russians have sent a number of spacecraft to explore Venus. And I believe the one that lasted the longest before it succumbed to the harsh conditions lasted about 90 minutes. So we can't even make spacecraft that can withstand the environment on Venus. It's a very, very harsh environment. Um, notice it's Volcanically active, has um, volcanoes. It has no magnetic field. Now that's a weird one. It's a really weird one. Venus is roughly the same size as Earth, which means it should have formed with about the same everything as Earth. Earth still has a molten core, molten rock swirling around, molten iron, as we believe. Venus has not cooled as well as the Earth because it has such a big greenhouse effect. So it should have more molten material in its core than we do. So it should definitely have the molten material. Now, what things have you learned are necessary to make the Earth's magnetic field? You have the melted metal and what else? Going around. Is Venus rotating? The answer is a bizarre one. It's rotating backward very, very slowly. So, you know how we're going around like this. So we're orbiting the sun and we're turning like this at the same time. So every day we're facing the sun again. And every year we've done one complete rotation. Venus is doing it more like this. Very slowly turning, but turning in the opposite direction. How weird is that? So it is rotating, but really slowly. 
Computer simulations indicate even with its very, very slow rotation, it should be making a magnetic field that has molten core. But there's one more piece to making that magnetic field that we haven't discussed. And that is you also have to have convection in the core. You have to have hot material floating up and colder material floating down. So the conclusion that scientists have drawn is that because the surface is so hot, there must not really be a difference in temperature from the outer part to the inner part of that bolted core. It's all the same very hot temperature, so you don't have the convection, and that's why it doesn't have a magnetic field. Now, a big question, why is Venus rotating backward? There's a lot of options here. A lot of options. No one has the absolute answer. We have the one we think is correct, but it's, there's still debate. So why should it rotate the same way that we do? Why, why, why do I expect that? Well, kind of, but kind of not. First of all, most of us just simply say, that's the way we are, that's the way everything should be. But maybe we're wrong in that. But scientifically, by the way, pray for Dr. Wolf. She's going to have surgery again right now. If you see her walking out, she's um, she had surgery for cancer what a month ago, um, and she's going to have to have chemotherapy and they have to put in a port. So she's going to just have surgery to put in a port right now. So it's not a major surgery this time, but it's always rough. Um, sorry, she just walked out. And that's why I said that. The reason we believe that it should be rotating like us, all of the other planets, except for Uranus, are rotating like us. So Venus and Uranus are the only ones that aren't rotating like us. And we believe they should because we're going all in the same plane, all in the same direction in our orbit, because we believe that we had that big solar nebula, had a general spin, collisions made everything rotate the same in that solar nebula. And because of everything rotating the same, it turns out that things should also be spinning in the same direction. So we believe that things, just with the solar nebula theory, that they should all be spinning the same direction. But Venus is not. It's spinning backward. So now establishing it should be forward, as far as we can understand, the best answer scientists have for why it's spinning backward is basically you have a ball like this, it's spinning like this, and if something comes and hits it this way, if it hits it hard enough, it can make it spin the other direction. And so that's what they think must have happened. There must have been a collision that came in and punched it like this to make it spin the opposite direction. Now think about that, you're on a planet. What kind of collision does that planet have to have that's rough enough to make it start rotating backwards? That's a devastating collision. It would have to be a very massive object coming pretty fast. What would happen to you if you were on the planet would that happen? You would go a flying. Flat earthers get all bent out of shape about how can we pretend that the earth is spinning because according to the ball theory, as they call it, we're spinning on the surface, we're moving about, what is it, a thousand miles an hour? And they say, yeah, should that wind be knocking you over? Well, no, because everything is. But if the Earth suddenly stops spinning 1,000 miles an hour that direction, start going 100 miles an hour that direction, what would you do? You have inertia. You don't want to change your motion. You keep flying until you smash on something. Right? That would devastate everything on Earth, even if you're well away from the collision point. So... Something like that, that kind of collision would have to destroy everything. Now, when we get to the Earth, which is our next stop, oh, something else I just have to point out, especially because we have only one male student in the class. By international convention, everything on Venus is named with a woman's name, except for there, there are two exceptions. Um, there is... Uh, there is one that I think is gender neutral, and I think there's one that's male. But everything else is female. And of course, the Max, I think it's Mount Maxwell, 
is the one that's male. Um, I, I'm just going off memory here. I think it's just named before they came up with the convention that everything on Venus is going to be female. All right, then we get to Earth, the third planet from the sun. It's where we have life. Now, if you look at this picture, this is an important picture. Human life and all the life we see on Earth requires certain temperature conditions. And so we call the region where you're going to have the conditions where life could exist, the habitable zone. Or sometimes we call it the Goldilocks zone because it's just right. If you're closer to the sun, it's too hot. If you're farther from the sun, it's too cold. And if you're in the habitable region, it's your habitable zone, it's just right, the Goldilocks uh, idea. And so Earth is in the inner edge of that Goldilocks region. That means we're on the hotter side of what would be best for life. If the Earth was somewhere out here, I suppose, it would be considered more hospitable to life. And notice Mars. Mars is at the outer edge of that habit habitable zone. So conceivably, there could be life like we know it on Mars if we have the right conditions. So this is the region where water is neither solid nor gas, but liquid on the surface. Well, as we, Mars, that's why they spend so much time looking for liquid water on Mars, because there should be the possibility of liquid water on Mars. And to quote former Vice President Dan Quayle, if there's water, that means there's oxygen. If there's oxygen, that means we can breathe, so we can live there. Okay, he's very wrong in his logical steps, but I'm sure somebody tried to explain it to him, and it was, well, like you sitting in my class, sometimes I say things that just don't make sense to you because you don't have the context. And that's what he was lacking was the context. It's not that water means oxygen and oxygen you can breathe because you can't breathe underwater. But if you have water, you have one of the things we need for life and there are oxygen molecules, which means you're likely to have some oxygen in the atmosphere, which we can breathe. Okay, so Earth. We've already talked a lot about Earth. I wanna just mention our moon. Did I talk about before when we were in geology how the moon formed? Don't think so. Well, the scientific theory for how the moon formed, there's a lot of things that people have considered, of course. One is that the moon just co-formed with the Earth, that the moon formed close enough to the Earth that the two were just constantly orbiting each other. I mean, remember, Mercury is just about the same size as the moon, just a tiny bit small, larger than the moon. So that would be an option. Or maybe the moon was something that came flying by that we captured. So scientists have looked into those options and have determined, no, those are unlikely the answer. What they have determined that is the most likely reason we have a moon is that at some point in the very distant past, we had a big collision. A big collision with something that's like a third our size or so. That kind of collision is going to be catastrophic again to life. Any life that existed before that collision would not have existed after that collision. It would have all been destroyed. Of course, I believe that God created life well after this, you know, my, my belief system. And so the moon is believed to have been material from mostly the Earth, but maybe also from that object that got knocked out into orbit around the Earth. It was orbiting around the Earth and just like the whole solar nebula theory, it started clumping and formed into a ball. Reasons for this are, or include, means not sneezing, maybe. The, uh, I haven't sneezed yet, we're doing well. The materials, the isotopes in the moon are very, very similar to those on Earth, which suggests that they formed from the same uh, material the moon has far less iron than the earth. Why would that be? Well, their theory is that the earth had already differentiated, so most of the iron in the earth was already in the core. So that collision is going to be knocking off stuff in the outer parts of the earth, the crust and the mantle, and that's depleted in iron because that's sunk to the core, so the, the moon is iron poor compared to the earth. It's believed that's because of the collision. 
The final of the inner planets is Mars, the fourth planet from the sun and potentially habitable for life. It has a really thin atmosphere, only about 10% as thick as the Earth's atmosphere. It has an atmosphere, but it's only about 10% as thick as ours. That atmosphere is also nothing like ours. It's 95% carbon dioxide and 15% oxygen. So with the atmosphere that thin, even if it was 100% oxygen, you know what would happen if you were there? You would suffocate. Even if it's 100% oxygen, there's just not enough for you to breathe. So you would, to make it habitable for life, you would need to have a thicker atmosphere, find a way to thicken it up. And you'd clearly have to change it. You'd have to get a bunch of oxygen in there. Yeah, keep the carbon dioxide, I don't care. Just add you know, 10 times that in oxygen, and we're probably going to be OK then. So it would need to have more atmosphere to be habitable, and it'd have to be largely oxygen. You watch sci-fi movies, and sometimes they'll have, I've seen one where a guy lives in a greenhouse on Mars. There's just not enough pressure. That's not going to work out. Um, its temperatures in the daytime, it gets as high as about 30 degrees Celsius. Now, we don't use Celsius here in the United States regularly, but 30 degrees Celsius, it's like a warm 80. Right, that's that's a good good warm temperature on Earth. Not hot, certainly not cold. So the daytime temperature on the equator is pretty nice. Of course, the nighttime temperature minus 130 degrees Celsius that might get to you. Doesn't have as big a swing as Mercury because it has a lot more atmosphere than Mercury. Has a way bigger swing than Earth because it has a lot less atmosphere than Earth. And of course, Venus has no swing. It's just the same. Okay, I'm going to stop the lecture here because